disaster no one had dreamed of happened at 4.54 in the afternoon on Saturday, June the 1st. The Nitro Chemical Works at Flixborough in Lincolnshire blew up. It was the biggest ever explosion in peacetime Britain. 29 people died, 105 were taken to hospital. The blast could be heard 30 miles away across the Humber. A pall of smoke one mile high hung over the Lincolnshire countryside. It took 36 hours for firemen using 40 pumps to put out the flames. 3,000 people were evacuated from seven villages. Hundreds of homes were damaged or destroyed. It had been the only plant in Britain making caprolactam, a vital ingredient of nylon, a process known to the be dangerous. The danger process in the process at uh, Flixborough was the oxidation step to get the caprolactam. Here they oxidise cyclohexane with air under some considerable pressure and a fairly high temperature and it is a dangerous process. So, how did the disaster happen? The first questions are, how did the Nitro plant come to be situated at Flixborough in the first place? How was planning permission given? The plant was there, quite simply, because chemicals had been made at Flixborough since before the last war. They'd been used in fertilizers. Planning permission was given by the old Lincolnshire County Council. The plant was to be built on an existing site. Were any compromises made? We know that when Dutch state mines applied for it, no objections were accorded. No objections from the local council, from the Lincolnshire County Council, none from local residents. It was the same story in 1971, when Nitro wanted to make it bigger. No objections recorded. Could that have been out of ignorance? To this day, the factory's inspectorate is obliged to keep details of new processes secret, and there's also no obligation for planning authorities to consider the distance between factories and housing. Planning, then, was no problem. So the factory was built and was producing caprolactam. But what was it like to work in? What were the safety regulations? We had the safety precautions per section, and this, you, you well, the signs are gone now, but everyone on, who went on site had to leave his matches and his lighter behind, things like that. Uh, we had, for the, for, we had, were developing and had drafted a disaster plan, which, of course, should cope with uh, the da disasters as we saw them. Uh, but, of course, this is much beyond anything anyone has ever seen. This disaster plan that you were drawing up, what did that include that perhaps you hadn't uh, incorporated already? Well, the only thing I can say is that it, of course, was trying to cope with the situation as we would have expected. And this is, uh, I think, a must stress that we think, I think, and possibly the, the outcome of this inquiry will be that this, there's been a new, a new phenomena here which is not, not known yet. I mean, this is beyond the scale which, which you could reasonably expect. Now, talking about scales that you could reasonably expect, what was the most serious disaster that you had envisaged that you would have to cope with? Well, we would certainly have we certainly envisaged that we had made emergency plans for fires, uh, possibly explosions. But the sort of explosion fires, as you can see out there, we, we, we certainly had not envisaged. Now, you say you hadn't envisaged it, but you are dealing with very volatile materials here. Yes. Um, shouldn't a disaster plan of this kind have been in force for a long time, since you opened? Well, uh, of course, the general idea was already existing. This was a disaster plan where, in fact, uh, you look at concentrating people in this spot and that spot, uh, where you make a plan for trying to count noses. And we had, for instance, as a, as a control point, we had a general front office, which is the, 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 the rubble you see there. Uh, if we had concentrated any people there, they would all have been killed. 
crucial questions the public inquiry will have to look into. And they all hinge on what kind of emergencies could have been reasonably expected. For a start, how good was the company's safety record in making Capro Lactan? It is for us a complete amazement that it happened because uh, we have been producing Capro since 1954 or somewhere around that might be 53. So uh, you might say it for 20 years now. And uh, we never had uh, any accident whatsoever uh, that uh, to, to speak of. Then, were there the kind of safety features you'd expect in a plant of this type? Also, the process has inbuilt safety features, which uh, makes it shut itself down. If the temperature becomes too high or pressure, then automatically uh, action is taken, which defeats this. If the explosion was caused by a new phenomenon, had anyone worked out what the effects of the greatest imaginable disaster might be? For example, when a nuclear power station is built, safety experts have to work out what would happen if a fully laden jumbo jet landed right on the power station's core. Another key question, were there any warnings of the disaster to come? In 1969, just a few tons of cyclohexane exploded at ICI Wilton on Teesside. At the time, one investigator said it could have led to a chain reaction which could have destroyed the whole place. And even more recently, the chief inspector of factories wrote that with new processes, we are increasingly faced with the risk of failures which could result in multiple deaths and injuries of near disaster proportions. And were Nipro's employees properly protected? For example, were there enough escape routes? And I ran towards the, the doors, and you just hoped that the staircase was there, because I didn't fully expect to see the staircase disappeared, but it was still there, and I ran down the stairs, and the, the glass at the bottom it had gone, so I didn't have to go through the doors. I went straight out, out the, through the glass panel, where the glass panel was big, and then along the side of the stores, and there was from the storekeepers and that were coming out of stores, they were blood running down the face, they cut everywhere, and it was coming across from the boiler plant. And uh, I was off trying to get out, but I didn't realise there was a fence running around the perimeter. I thought I could get over it somehow. But uh, I just wanted to get out. I realised I wasn't enough time to be trying to climb over this fence. So one of the chances was you wanted to be heading along the railway embankment towards the, to the wards of the wharf, which meant going more or less full circle around the plant. To those who were there, the reaction of the emergency services was impressive. An alarm sounded at Scunthorpe Power Station one minute before the blast, and immediately fire engines and ambulances were on their way to the scene. Even so, is it good enough that amongst the very first to arrive were volunteers from the Salvation Army? They, they were here before, they were here before even the police, and they were straight yeah. into the front end and really helped us. Well, I'm the Goodwill Officer for Harland. We have got a minibus here which we've got equipment on hand for emergencies such as this. What sort of equipment? Well, T-arms, um, blankets, this type of thing. We haven't had to use the blankets, but we, we've brought, yeah. we brought we loaded everything we could lay yeah. hands on. Hull and Nottingham, Nottingham was here. and uh, oh, the Red people. Shield at uh, Warrington and Doncaster. They all brought what they had, you know, so that we and could then, serve uh, as many. I was so poor, it was open all night. But and I was at a meeting this And we haven't morning. closed down yes. since we arrived. Have you felt very sorry you've seen us in such sad circumstances, Mr. Oh, Edson? my goodness, it's appalling. I was looking forward to coming and seeing the plant for yeah. yeah. operational. Yeah. Listen to that. and socially it was something quite exceptional we thought you know, it really was, and his contribution to the balance of payments yeah. oh. there it is yeah. well goodbye, I think, goodbye. goodbye. As far as the actual explosion is concerned, the main question, of course, is what caused it? Well, we do, in fact, have a pretty good idea about that, because the first report by the factory inspector suggests that it was caused by the fracturing of a pipe in the part of the plant where cyclohexane was oxidized. And, in fact, early in the week, the man in charge of the investigations, Mr. Anthony Smith, had some pretty definite thoughts on the subject. Well, uh, uh, as I see it, there was, a, there was an, uh, an escape of, of, of uh, flammable vapor which ignited and that's as far as I can go at the moment that's the, that's the line that I'm pursuing 
While the immediate concern was obviously to deal with the aftermath of the explosion at the chemical works itself, the people of the villages round about were also in desperate need of help. But how large was the area affected, and how quickly was help given to the villagers, and how much has been done to help them since? Devastation was at its worst five miles around the factory. But amazingly, a seven-foot piece of metal landed on the other side of the Humber at Anlaby near Hull. There was no real local disaster plan, but that night all those evacuated from the seven nearby villages had somewhere to sleep. Luckily, night probe was in the country. If it had been near a town like most chemical factories, the damage could have been much worse. Even so, Flixborough will mean the biggest insurance payout in Britain's peacetime history. But on the morning after, the long-term problems like damage to the houses began to emerge. What could be done about them? So is this the first time this you've seen the house? the first time I've seen the house. I've been up all night thinking about it and haven't seen it till this minute. What was your reaction when you did see it? Oh, I just burst into tears. It's a lot worse than I imagined. I couldn't credit that it was like this. I had no idea. It's fantastic. Oh, heavens. Oh, it's like a, a bomb struck, isn't it? Oh, no. I couldn't save a thing. Well, oh, the structure's all gone. There's no roof. Everything's... Oh, I had no idea it was like this. No idea. I don't know. Maybe when I get another home and try to put things in it, perhaps then I'll realise what's gone. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe never. When you're my age, you, you don't start afresh, do you? I haven't got so many years to start again. <laughs> During the week, long-term plans were made. At Flixborough, the homeless moved into caravans. Nitro formed a committee to help the people out. How could the government help? Michael Foote arrived to speak to the villagers and to carry letters about their worries back to his colleagues in Whitehall. What happens when there's been so much damage then that your insurance doesn't, that you're insured for, doesn't cover the extent of the damage? No, well, this is another of the questions that we are taking up and I think that is included in one of the letters that we have here because some people are covered, their insurances covers it and others, they are not covered and we will have to see how uh, we can get that situation dealt with partly by the... Uh, we will have to try and sort out the responsibility. Uh, the firm has some responsibility for compensation. Well, we can just hope that the village can be put back as it was before and we'll try starting to live our lives again. But we don't want the fear to be lingering at the back of our minds that sometime on a sunny Saturday afternoon in a lovely little village something like that's going to happen again. There's only one way that I can see to avoid it. As long as there's a factory there producing a similar thing, our fear will always be there that it's impossible, that it can happen again. So, so far as I can see, no rebuilding of that type of factory within the reach of the blast. No, well, I understand, uh, I, understand the, mm, I understand the anxieties that you express, and of course one of the things that uh, I've obviously had conversations throughout the day with people who are still employed at the plant and with others who are working there and uh, with others in the other villages have all raised this uh, question with me as to what is to be the future of the plant. Uh, there is no decision taken about that and of course partly the future will depend upon the findings of the public inquiry. It's almost impossible for an outsider to really appreciate the plight of the villagers who lived round the devastated plants. The physical damage to the buildings themselves is obvious, but it often takes a more trivial detail to really push the message home. Not long after the explosion, I went into the living room of a house in one of the villages. Obviously, a fish had been in a glass case on the wall. 
When I got there, everything in the room was damaged. The glass case had completely shattered. And the only thing that survived intact was the fish itself, all washed up on the top of the piano. But there may not just be physical troubles. Many of the villagers have been suffering from shock ever since the explosion. So what future is there for these villages now? I think we can carry on, but if I may make a, a special point, I know in this technologi technological age we have to have places like Nipro, but on the other hand, I think it's been on, tele on television already, the government are investigating it, but I'm concerned with the lasting misery of the people occasioned by this disaster. It's not the physical things of the rebuilding and so on, but the, the effect on people's minds. I mean, whether a lot of people will ever recover from... The child. And, and the, the children, whether they'll ever recover from the shock they've had. And every, every sound they hear, of course, they're nervous and they jump and they even have nightmares. Uh, we shall never forget it. But I think in time that, it, you know, we'll all get together and especially if we've no fear of anything happening, we'll be all right. I'm sure we will. Anyway, we'll do our best. This disaster raises some wider questions. The petrochemical industry has developed very rapidly since the war. Cyclohexane, for example, wasn't really commercially produced until the 1950s. So has technology moved too fast? Have we been ignorant of all the dangers? Have we literally been playing with fire? Should there be tighter controls on giant corporations that use new processes? All questions the public inquiry will have to examine. Those, then, are some of the questions. And amidst all the uncertainties, one thing is sure. It's going to take time to get the answers. Time for the factory inspector to pinpoint the exact cause of the explosion. Time for the public inquiry to be set up and to prepare its report. For this small community to get over the loss of so many young men. And time for the people of the villages round about the Nipro plant to pick up the pieces, not only of their shattered houses, but also of the lives they led before the explosion.